The Olive by Algernon Blackwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Olive by Algernon Blackwood. He laughed involuntarily as the olive rolled towards his chair across the shiny parquet floor of the hotel dining room. His table in the cavernous salle à manger was apart. He sat alone, a solitary guest. The table from which the olive fell and rolled towards him was some distance away. The angle, however, made him an unlikely objective. Yet the lopsided, juicy thing after hesitating once or twice en route, as it plopped along, came to rest finally against his feet. It settled with an inviting, almost an aggressive air, and he stooped and picked it up, putting it rather self-consciously because of the girl from whose table it had come, on the white tablecloth beside his plate. Then, looking up, he caught her eye and saw that she too was laughing, though not a bit self-consciously. As she helped herself to the hors d'oeuvre, a false move had sent it flying. She watched him pick up the olive and set it beside his plate. Her eyes then suddenly looked away again at her mother questioningly. The incident was closed, but the little oblong succulent olive lay beside his plate so that his fingers played with it. He fingered it automatically from time to time until his lonely meal was finished. When no one was looking he slipped it into his pocket, as though having taken the trouble to pick it up, this was the very least he could do with it. Heaven alone knows why, but he then took it upstairs with him, setting it on the marble mantelpiece among his field glasses, tobacco tins, ink bottles, pipes and candlesticks. At any rate, he kept it, the moist, shiny, lopsided, juicy little oblong olive. The hotel lounge wearied him. He came to his room after dinner to smoke at his ease, his coat off and his feet on a chair, to read another chapter of Freud, to write a letter or two he didn't in the least want to write, and then go to bed at ten o'clock. But this evening the olive kept rolling between him and the thing he read. It rolled between the paragraphs, between the lines. The olive was more vital than the interest of these eternal complexes and suppressed desires. The truth was that he kept seeing the eyes of the laughing girl beyond the bouncing olive. She had smiled at him in such a natural, spontaneous, friendly way before her mother's glance had checked her, a smile he felt that might lead to acquaintance on the morrow. He wondered, a thrill of possible adventure ran through him. She was a merry-looking sort of girl with a happy, half roguish face that seemed on the lookout for somebody to play with. Her mother, like most of the people in the big hotel, was an invalid. The girl, a dutiful and patient daughter. They had arrived that very day, apparently. A laugh is a revealing thing, he thought as he fell asleep to dream of a lopsided olive rolling consciously towards him, and of a girl's eyes that watched its awkward movements, then looked up into his own and laughed. In his dream the olive had been deliberately and cleverly dispatched upon its uncertain journey. It was a message. He did not know, of course, that the mother, chiding her daughter's awkwardness, had muttered, There you go again, child, true to your name. You never see an olive without doing something queer and odd with it. A youngish man whose knowledge of chemistry, including invisible inks and such like mysteries, had proved so valuable to the censor's department that for five years he had overworked without a holiday. The Italian Riviera had attracted him, and he had come out for a two months rest. It was his first visit. Sun, mimosa, blue seas, 
and brilliant skies had tempted him exchange made a pound worth forty fifty sixty and seventy shillings he found the place lovely but somewhat untenanted having chosen at random he had come to a spot where the companionship he hoped to find did not exist the place languished after the war slow to recover the colony of resident english was scattered still travellers preferred the coast of france with menton and monte carlo to enliven them the country moreover was distracted by strikes the electric light failed one week letters the next and as soon as the electricians and postal workers resumed the railways stopped running few visitors came and the few who came soon left he stayed on however caught by the sunshine and the good exchange also without the physical energy to discover a better livelier place he went for walks among the olive groves he sat beside the sea and palms he visited shops and bought things he did not want because the exchange made them seem cheap he paid immense extras in his weekly bill then chuckled as he reduced them to shillings and found that a few pence covered them he lay with a book for hours among the olive groves the olive groves his daily life could not escape the olive groves to olive groves sooner or later his walks his expeditions his menderings by the sea his shopping all led him to these ubiquitous olive groves if he bought a picture postcard to send home there was sure to be an olive grove in one corner of it the whole place was smothered with olive groves the people owed their incomes and existence to these irrepressible trees the villages among the hills swam roof deep in them they swarmed even in the hotel gardens the guide-books praised them as persistently as the resident brought them sooner or later into every conversation they grew lyrical over them and how do you like our olive trees ah uh, you think them pretty at first most people are disappointed they grow on one they do he agreed i'm glad you appreciate them i find them the embodiment of grace and when the wind lifts the underleaves across the whole mountain slope why it's wonderful isn't it one realizes the meaning of olive green one does he sighed but all the same i should like to get one to eat an olive i mean ah to eat yes that's not so easy you see the crop is exactly he interrupted impatiently weary of the habitual and evasive explanations but i should like to taste the fruit i should like to enjoy one for after a stay of six weeks he had never once seen an olive on the table in the shops nor even on the street barrows at the market-place he had never tasted one no one solid olive though olive trees were a drug in the place no one bought them no one asked for them it seemed that no one wanted them the trees when he looked closely were thick with a dark little berry that seemed more like a sour sloe than the succulent delicious spicy fruit associated with its name men climbed the trunks everywhere shaking the laden branches and hitting them with long bamboo poles to knock the fruit off while women and children squatting on their haunches spent laborious hours filling baskets underneath then loading mules and donkeys with their daily catch but an olive to eat was unobtainable he had never cared for olives but now he craved with all his soul to feel his teeth in one ah but it is the spanish olive that you eat explained the head waiter a german from basel these are for oil only after which he disliked the olive more than ever until that night when he saw the first eatable specimen rolling across the shiny parquet floor propelled towards him 
by the careless hand of a pretty girl, who then looked up into his eyes and smiled. He was convinced that Eve similarly had rolled the apple towards Adam across the emerald sward of the first garden in the world. He slept usually like the dead. It must have been something very real that made him open his eyes and sit up in bed alertly. There was a noise against his door. He listened. The room was still quite dark. It was early morning. The noise was not repeated. "'Who's there?' he asked in a sleepy whisper. "'What is it?' The noise came again. Someone was scratching on the door. No, it was somebody tapping. "'What do you want?' he demanded in a louder voice. "'Come in!' he added, wondering sleepily whether he was presentable. Either the hotel was on fire, or the porter was waking the wrong person for some sunrise expedition. Nothing happened. Wide awake now he turned the switch on, but no light flooded the room. The electricians, he remembered with a curse, were out on strike. He fumbled for the matches, and as he did so, a voice in the corridor became distinctly audible. It was just outside his door. "'Aren't you ready?' he heard. "'You sleep forever.' And the voice, although never having heard it before, he could not have recognized it, belonged, he knew suddenly, to the girl who had let the olive fall. In an instant he was out of bed. He lit a candle. "'I'm coming!' he called softly, as he slipped rapidly into some clothes. "'I'm sorry I've kept you. I shan't be a minute.' "'Be quick, then!' he heard, while the candle flame slowly grew, and he found his garments. Less than three minutes later, he opened the door, and, candle in hand, peered into the dark passage. "'Blow it out!' came a peremptory whisper. He obeyed, but not quick enough. A pair of red lips emerged from the shadows. There was a puff, and the candle was extinguished. "'I've got my reputation to consider. We mustn't be seen, of course.' The face vanished in the darkness, but he had recognized it. The shining skin, the bright glancing eyes, the sweet breath touched his cheek. The candlestick was taken from him by a swift, deft movement. He heard it knock the wainscoting as it was set down. He went out into a pitch-black corridor, where a soft hand seized his own and led him, by a back door, it seemed, out into the open air of the hillside immediately behind the hotel. He saw the stars. The morning was cool and fragrant. The sharp air waked him, and the last vestige of sleep went flying. He had been drowsy and confused, had obeyed the summons without thinking. He now realized suddenly that he was engaged in an act of madness. The girl, dressed in some flimsy material thrown loosely about her head and body, stood a few feet away, looking, he thought, like some figure called out of dreams and slumber of a forgotten world, out of legend almost. He saw her evening shoes peep out, he divined an evening dress beneath the gauzy covering. The light wind blew it close against her figure. He thought of a nymph. "'I say, but haven't you been to bed?' he asked stupidly. He had meant to expostulate, to apologize for his foolish rashness, to scold and say they must go back at once. Instead, this sentence came. He guessed she had been sitting up all night. He stood still a second, staring in mute admiration, his eyes full of bewildered question. "'Watching the stars!' She met his thought with a happy laugh. "'Orion has touched the horizon. I came for you at once. We've got just four hours.' The voice, the smile, the eyes, the reference to Orion, swept him off his feet. Something in him broke loose and flew wildly, recklessly to the stars. "'Let us be off!' he cried, "'before the bear tilts down, 
Already Alcon begins to fade. I'm ready. Come. She laughed. The wind blew the gauze aside to show two ivory-white limbs. She caught his hand again, and they scampered together up the steep hillside, towards the woods. Soon the big hotel, the villas, the white houses of the little town, where natives and visitors still lay soundly sleeping, were out of sight. The farther sky came down to meet them. The stars were paling, but no sign of actual dawn was yet visible. The freshness stung their cheeks. Slowly the heavens grew lighter, the east turned rose, the outline of the trees defined themselves, there was a stirring of the silvery green leaves. They were among olive groves, but the spirits of the trees were dancing. Far below them, a pool of deep color, they saw the ancient sea. They saw the tiny specks of distant fishing boats. The sailors were singing to the dawn, and birds among the mimosa of the hanging gardens answered them. Pausing a moment at length beneath a gaunt old tree, who struggled to leave the clinging earth, had tortured its great writhing arms and trunk. They took their breath, gazing at one another with eyes full of happy dreams. "'You understood so quickly,' said the girl, "'my little message. I knew by your eyes and ears you would.' and she first tweaked his ears with two slender fingers mischievously, then laid her soft palm with a momentary light pressure on both eyes. "'You're half and half, at any rate,' she added, looking him up and down for a swift instant of appraisement. "'If you're not all together.' The laughter showed her white, even little teeth. "'You know how to play, and that's something,' she added. Then, as if to herself, "'You'll be all together before I've done with you.' "'Shall I?' he stammered, afraid to look at her. Puzzled, some spirit of compromise still lingering in him, he knew not what she meant. He knew only that the current of life flowed increasingly through his veins, but that her eyes confused him. I'm longing for it, he added. How wonderfully you did it. They roll so awkwardly. Oh, that, she peered at him through a wisp of hair. You've kept it, I hope? Rather, it's on my mantelpiece. You're sure you haven't eaten it? And she made a delicious mimicry with her red lips, so that he saw the tip of a small pointed tongue. I shall keep it, he swore as long as these arms have life in them, and he seized her just as she was crouching to escape, and covered her with kisses. I knew you longed to play, she panted when he released her. Still it was sweet of you to pick it up before another got it. Another? he exclaimed. The gods decide. It's a lopsided thing, remember. It can't roll straight. She looked oddly, mischievous, elusive. He stared at her. If it had rolled elsewhere, and another had picked it up, he began, I should be with that other now. And this time she was off and away before he could prevent her. And the sound of her silvery laughter mocked him among the olive trees beyond. He was up and after her in a second, following her slim whiteness in and out of the old world groove as she flitted lightly, her hair flying in the wind, her figure flashing like a ray of sunlight, or the rays of foaming water, till at last he caught her, and drew her down upon his knees, and kissed her wildly, forgetting who and where and what he was. Hark! she whispered breathlessly, one arm close about his neck. I hear their footsteps. Listen, it is the pipe. The pipe, he repeated, conscious of a tiny but delicious shudder. For a sudden chill ran through him as she said it. He gazed at her. The hair fell loose about her cheeks, flushed and rosy with hot kisses. Her eyes were bright and wild for all their softness. 
her face turned sideways to him as she listened wore an extraordinary look that for an instant made his blood run cold he saw the parted lips the small white teeth the slim neck of ivory the young bosom panting from his temptuous embrace of an unearthly loveliness and brightness she seemed to him yet with this strange remote expression that touched his soul with sudden terror her face turned slowly who are you he whispered he sprang to his feet without waiting for her answer he was young and agile strong too with that quick response of muscle they have who keep their bodies well but he was no match for her her speed and agility outclassed his own with ease she leapt before he had moved one leg forward towards escape she was clinging with soft supple arms and limbs about him so that he could not free himself and as her weight bore him downwards to the ground her lips found his own and kissed them into silence she lay buried again in his embrace her hair across his eyes her heart against his heart and he forgot his question forgot his little fear forgot the very world he knew they come they come she cried gaily the dawn is here are you ready i've been ready for five thousand years he answered leaping to his feet beside her all together came upon a sparkling laugh that was like wind among the olive leaves shaking her last gauzy covering from her she snatched his hand and they ran forward together to join the dancing throng now crowding up the slope beneath the trees their happy singing filled the sky decked with vine and ivy and trailing silvery green branches they poured in a flood of radiant life along the mountain side slowly they melted away into the blue distance of the breaking dawn and as the last figure disappeared the sun came up slowly out of a purple sea they came to the place he knew the deserted earthquake village and a faint memory stirred in him he did not actually recall that he had visited it already had eaten his sandwiches with hotel friends beneath its crumbling walls but there was a dim troubling sense of familiarity nothing more the houses still stood but pigeons lived in them and weasels stoats and snakes had their uncertain homes in ancient bedrooms not twenty years ago the peasants thronged its narrow streets through which the dawn now peered and cool wind breathed among dew-laden brambles i know the house she cried the house where we would live and raised a flying form of air and sunlight into a tumbled cottage that had no roof no floor or windows wild bees had hung a nest against the broken wall he followed her there was sunlight in the room and there were flowers upon a rude simple table lay a bowl of cream with eggs and honey and butter close against a home-made loaf they sank into each other's arms upon a couch of fragrant grass and boughs against the window where wild roses bloomed and the bees flew in and out it was busana the so-called earthquake village because a sudden earthquake had fallen on it one summer morning when all the inhabitants were at church the crashing roof killed sixty the tumbling walls another hundred and the rest had left it where it stood the church he said vaguely remembering the story they were at prayer the girl laughed carelessly in his ear setting his blood in a rush and quiver of delicious joy he felt himself untamed wild as the wind and animals the true god claimed his own she whispered he came back ah they were not ready the old priests had seen to that but he came 
they heard his music then his tread shook the olive groves the old ground danced the hills leapt for joy and the houses crumbled he laughed as he pressed her closer to his heart and now we've come back she cried merrily we've come back to worship and be glad she nestled into him while the sun rose higher i hear them hark she cried and again leapt dancing from his side again he followed her like wind through the broken window they saw the naked fauns and nymphs and satyrs rolling dancing shaking their soft hoofs amid the ferns and brambles towards the appalling ruptured church they sped with feet of light and air a roar of happy song and laughter rose come he cried we must go too hand in hand they raced to join the tumbling dancing throng she was in his arms and on his back and flung across his shoulders as he ran they reached the broken building its whole roof gone sliding years ago its walls a tremble still its shattered shrines alive with the nesting birds hush she whispered in a tone of awe yet pleasure he is there she pointed her bare arm outstretched above the bending heads there in the empty space where one stood sacred host and cup he sat filling the niche sublimely and with awful power his shaggy form benign yet terrible rose through the broken stone the great eyes shone and smiled the feet were lost in brambles god cried a wild frightened voice yet with deep worship in it and the old familiar panic came with portentous swiftness the great figure rose the birds flew screaming the animals sought holes the worshippers laughing and glad a moment ago rushed tumbling over one another for the doors he goes again who called who called like that his feet shake the ground it's the earthquake screamed a woman's shrill accents in ghastly terror kiss me one kiss before we forget again sighed a laughing passionate voice against his ear once more your arms your heart beating on my lips you recognized his power you are now all together we shall remember but he woke with the heavy bedclothes stuffed against his mouth and the wind of early morning sighing mournfully about the hotel walls have they left again those ladies he inquired casually of the head waiter pointing to the table they were here last night at dinner who do you mean replied the man stupidly gazing at the spot indicated with a face quite blank last night at dinner he tried to think an english lady elderly with her daughter at which moment precisely the girl came in alone lunch was over the room empty there was a second's difficult pause it seemed ridiculous not to speak their eyes met the girl blushed furiously he was very quick for an englishman i was allowing myself to ask after your mother he began i was afraid he glanced at the table laid for one she was not well perhaps oh but that's very kind of you i'm sure she smiled he saw the small white even teeth and before three days had passed he was so deeply in love that he simply couldn't help himself i believe he said lamely this is yours you dropped it you know er may i keep it it's only an olive they were of course in an olive grove when he asked it and the sun was setting she looked at him looked him up and down looked at his ears his eyes he felt that in another second her little fingers would slip up and tweak the first or close the second with a soft pressure tell me he begged did you dream anything that first night i saw you she took a quick step backwards no she said as he followed her more quickly still 
I don't think I did. But, she went on breathlessly as he caught her up, I knew from the way you picked it up. Knew what? he demanded, holding her tightly, so that she could not get away again. That you were already half and half, but would soon be all together. And as he kissed her, he felt her soft little fingers tweak his ears. End of the Olive by Algernon Blackwood Read by Lars Rolander